Hey folks, Engineer775 here with Baxter. You gonna come up in here and video bomb me here? Yeah, there he is. Okay, I wanna to talk to you about uh, wood stoves, particularly the Pioneer Princess, though there are a lot of good wood, wood cook stoves out here. Behind me is a, a Mennonite Flame View stove we've used since 1997. It's been a great, great stove. I've never been in a house without a wood stove and almost every house I've lived in has had a wood cook stove. Um, so if you're preparing for an EMP, this is my first line of defense. Having a wood cook stove, something where you can heat your house, cook your food, heat your water, bake your bread, and pretty much dry your clothes. There's a lot of things that you can do. With. And having some way to get water into uh, the house, whether it be a hand pump and or some other device. But a hand pump and a wood cook stove and some food and a roof over your head, that's pretty much all you need. So. Um, this is gonna. This is just an intro to a pretty long video about a couple that lives up in Pennsylvania that has had a, had a Pioneer Princess for over six years. We've had our stove for 20 years, but they did a nice a, a nicer video than I have done on actually using the stove, cooking on it, uh, how to maintain it, and so it's a video about the Pioneer Princess. So I just wanted to tell you what you're about to watch is um, very important um, if you're considering getting a wood cook stove. On this stove that they're going to show, they don't have the side reservoir, they don't have the warming shelf. It's just a simple wood cook stove and that is fine. They also don't demonstrate the water heating coil that you can actually put in there to actually thermal siphon and heat water. While you're cooking, while you're baking, why not make hot water for your shelter? So there's a lot that you can do with a wood cook stove. I just wanted you to see some of the things from somebody else's perspective and how they've used the stove for the last six years. So if you want to be EMP proof, you want to be able to take care of your shelter in a grid down situation, you just can't beat a wood cook stove. And we highly recommend a Pioneer Princess, though they make an iron, um, a, so it's the Baker's Choice, which is the very small stove. It's minimal, it's not enamel coat. It's not a pretty stove, but it's a very functional stove. Um, and that has an oven, it can heat 2,000 square feet, you can heat water with it. The um, Pioneer Made, um, I'm not a big fan of uh, top loader stoves, the old type of sto cook stoves where you had to only load them through the eye in the top. So what I recommend is a front loader, like a normal wood stove. And so the Princess, the Pioneer Princess is kind of that perfect stove. It has front loading, it has the ability to heat water, uh, have passive heating of water, active heating of water, and also um, just on the warming shelf, a lot of options. So um, the if you want to get more information in the description, will be a link to the stove, so you can check that out. And I think that's about it. But I'm I'm just you know I grew up with a wood cook stove. I remember going to my grandmother's house. She had all the cast ironware. She had a commercial wood cook stove, and so we used to wake up having pancakes and eggs and bacon cooked on a wood stove. There's nothing like it, and I'm not trying to sell you the stove because of how good the food tastes, but it tastes awesome. Uh, so just a childhood memory of growing up with wood cook stoves in our homes, and just there's nothing like it. And the very, it just takes practice. You know, you'll burn your biscuits the first time you cook because you're not used to uh, the convection. There's a lot of airflow in a wood cook stove oven, I find, and so you get it almost like a convection oven. So it just takes some practice, like anything else. So you want to practice. Oh my, I've got another photo bomber here. So, well, it's kind of a zoo here, and uh, we'll sign out with uh, from the zoo here at at our farm. So, check out this video. Hopefully, it's helpful for you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Bill Berman. This is my wife. Janice. And we're going to uh, be telling you or showing you about our wood cook stove, which we've had for six years. Now we're going to show you the stove. This is the stove. We love this stove. And I'm going to start by showing you some of the things that we do. When we first got the stove, this top was just brand new shiny silver and I called the company and I said is this going to stay this way and he said no it won't don't be disappointed it's going to turn blue 
well, that was a little discouraging, but I kind of like how it turned out. It, it just matches the stove a lot better. And um, it's easy to clean. You have to clean it when, since we were talking about cleaning, you have to clean the top of the stove when it has gotten to the point where it's cooling down, you the wood, the, the fire has died out of it. If you can put your hand on this cool end long enough to be able to run a scratch pad across here, then you need to do this while there's heat to the stove. If you try to clean the stove while it's cold like it is now, any moisture that gets on here will create a rust area. It's a fine little film of rust, but it does it just almost instantly. So you need to clean the top of your stove while it's got enough heat to it. And as you move down and you're, you're working this way and you get to the hotter side, it has begun cooling down as you go. So it reaches a point, you do get some warm spots on your fingers. And, and, um, but anyway, it, it must be done while, while the stove is warm and you see the steam rising off as it dries. I have a few little um, pots and pans that I would like to show you that we use. And I have some over here. I have this old fashioned waffle iron that turns over. Obviously when it's hot, I can't put my hand on the top of it like I'm doing now. And then that just turns over. And that's how you continue to keep your, your, your iron hot. And then it's got this little lip around the edge so that if your waffle batter should run over, it'll run into that little pot. Doesn't always do it so meticulously as you'd like it to. But um, this is another one. When we decided that we, we had this idea many years ago that we wanted to live off the grid. And we found this little Belgian waffle iron to put on your stove in Minnesota, I believe. And it's got your temperature control here. And when you flip it over, it's got temperature control there. And we have used the daylights out of, out of this iron. And um, we, since we moved up here onto the mountain, it's been very, very useful. Then there are your bread pans which make a very nice loaf of bread. This one is a popover pan, but you can use it for muffins or anything else that um, wants that shape. And then we have our corn pan, and these you can find at antique stores. This little thing right here is well used, and we I could not afford to purchase one of these new, and we were at a yard sale these are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to $65. And we were at a yard sale and it was $8. So we grabbed it. It's a humidifier and you fill it to within about a quarter of an inch of the, of the top here with water. If you fill it any closer to the top, this water will start boiling when it's sitting on top of the stove. As it's creating steam in the room, um, it will also come to a boil, and I've had it boil out around the edges, and it makes these noises that sound like a cannon just went off. And it's scary at first till you finally start getting the hang of what happens, the noises that your stove makes. So that would just sit on here, and the steam would just come on out into the room. You have to pay attention to... Um, the fact that it's going down, it won't hurt it if, it, if the water just finally just steams completely away. Uh, many times it has sat here on the stove with no water in it. But I like to try to keep it full. And then I like to get a little atmosphere into the room during the holidays. Because once we turn this stove on, about the end of October, maybe even the middle of October, it's on 24-7 until summer until spring when we're done using the stove. So at Christmas time, I like to drop in maybe a, a stick of cinnamon and a few little whole allspice um, ball, little balls of allspice and some clove stems and just throw those in there. And then it just smells like there's a pie baking when someone comes in the door. The whole house smells very nice. The, uh, the stove is built 
at a low level, which we found is very good. Some of the other stoves are quite a bit higher, and then when you put a large pot on top, you can't, you can't see into it, especially when you're the height we are. And right below the firebox, you can see this is the firebox here, uh, we can fill that wood. We fill it, we pack it right to the top at night, and that will give us about eight to nine hours of burning, which is very adequate. Uh, this is showing right here uh, that we need to replace this gasket. Uh, anyway, um, what happens is once you get a good fire going, this area right here over this plate is the hottest area. And we, I even measured it recently and there was about 20, uh, 20 to 30 degrees difference, maybe 15 to 20 degrees difference. And so this is your hottest area. You're about medium heat and, and a lower heat down here. And we've had a little, uh, little rack, you know, for cooling cookies or whatever that we use and we just place it here and we, we toast our bread right here. Very simple and it works. And we just flip it over. And here's the oven. It's a quite a large oven, has some nice stainless steel sides and everything. Uh, we ordered this door with the glass in it. These will take a nice, nice size sheet of, for cookies or whatever you may, may bake. It's quite large. And um, sometimes we, you know, in the evening when we built the fire and we're ready to go to bed, uh, we packed the, the stove and uh, we, you could leave the door down and you get a lot more heat into the house. But we sometimes we want a little more heat, maybe during the day when it's in the winter time, we want a little more heat, but we don't really want to open this up because you ever bang your knee on one, one of these corners, it's not too comfortable. So we, I rigged up a little wire that we hook onto this little shelf support. And that's, we get a, a lot of heat, extra heat, heat out of there. This glass also comes with a thermometer in here, which is uh, 50 degrees off. So we have to figure if we want 350, we have to get it up to four. And uh, maintaining the heat is, is something that Janice will talk about. Uh, let's see, and then there's the little shelf up here. It's, this is not really a warming oven, though we, we were kind of wanted to get one, but at that time they were still working out some details on it. Now they have a beautiful one that has tempered glass sliding doors so you can actually see what's inside. But uh, anyway, it's a very nice stove. We've been very happy with it. And uh, I, oh, and this is the, yeah, the one to show you here. This is the way you get into the ash uh, tray. And here it is right here. And we'll be, when we do the cleaning of the stove, shortly we'll, uh, we'll go into that in a little more detail. Got to get this just in the right spot. I think that's pretty much it as far as the details of the stove. Oh, this one little area here. This is a little bar that's, it's, I don't know what kind of metal it's made of, but uh, when the stove is very hot, you can put your hand on this, you can lean on it, and you won't burn yourself. And I, that's basically, it's a, it's a guard. But these little screws here that come through from the, from the stove top, those you can get burned on. The Pioneer Princess stove has a manual and an automatic damper. We had the automatic, but we chose to go with the manual. It was just a little easier to control. Straight up here is pretty much wide open, and we close it down quite a bit, uh, just about where it's barely, barely open. You can just barely hear it burning. You know, that's for when we're burning at night, keeping the house warm. We put a, this tape, it's a, uh, this tape here uh, handles up to 400 degrees and these metal get too pretty hot. So we put that on there and so it's a little easier to take care of. We originally had these handles were the same kind of a steel wire kind of, I don't know what you call that, uh, and they were getting too hot. So we told them and they sent these, no charge, they're a very fine company, the Pioneer Stove Company. They're out of Kentucky and uh, they sent us these and we replaced the other ones. 
And around the back here, we have some controls that you need to see. This is the what allows the heat to go around the oven. Now the heat does go into the oven even when it's at this position, but when we push it in, then it, it, it uh, directs the heat around the oven. And uh, anyway, that's it's a pretty simple mechanism. And then also in the firebox to, uh, to get the ash to drop down, this, this little thing here uh, works back and forth. So it uh, helps get the ashes down there after you've finished a fire. And then down here we have a, uh, a draft control that allows air to come up under through that opening where the two bars are to give you a, a quick start. You know, when you're starting in the morning, you want a quick fire. And it uh, works really well. One additional comment about the bell draft is that uh, when you open it in the morning, uh, sometimes we've even used it in the evening. You've got to make sure you close it down again after, say, five or ten minutes. If you leave it open, your whole uh, night wood supply burns up very quickly, and suddenly the house gets cold in the middle of the night. <laughs> so we've learned the hard way. And on the back here, we have a 20-gallon reservoir. This is one of the lids here, and it holds water up to about here. It's not much to see. It's pretty dark in there. But uh, there's, a, there's a cover on both ends. And then we had, we had to use brass fittings here, the pipe and the uh, faucet. And this we get nice hot water all winter long and because uh, we don't run the stove very often uh, during the summertime. Right now it's just beginning of spring. We're still running it a little bit. And then we have a little uh, kitchen stove here, gas, that we use during the summertime, which we're going to replace soon here with one that uh, doesn't have to have a pilot and uh, it uh, means we can, we can even bake during the, the summertime. After several years, I decided that we got tired of filling this 20 gallon reservoir with, uh, with a faucet on the sink, so I rigged up a pipe coming up from the floor with a float valve here so that it would fill itself. Uh, we did find uh, when we had the valve open all the time that eventually one time the, the, the float valve seemed to have stuck and so we had a little overflow. So we now when we have water, you know, when it gets empty we just open the valve right here and let it in. And then when it gets to where we can't hear the water running, then we just turn it off so we don't leave it running with wide, wide open all the time. But anyway, it works, does the job. And again, like the bell draft in the back, this door here can act the same way because if that's a little bit open, it'll draft up and it'll burn your wood up and it'll also cause a very high heat. And you don't want this top to get like 600 degrees, which uh, we've a few times it has gotten red, you know, in the evening we, where it was a little darker, we could see it. So you've got to make sure this is closed and that was closed, and uh, of course this door closed, and then you get a nice burning fire through the night. Since we've had the stove about six years, uh, we've learned something about the cleaning of this stove that uh, we didn't know originally as we kind of trial and error. But you kind of have to stop, start at the top, and since the pipe is the, top, the highest thing, we start from there and we clean all the way down to the bottom. And uh, we'll show you as we go. Uh, first thing we have to do is take this stovepipe out, out of the chimney. Uh, this, is, this is stainless steel, and uh, it has gotten colored by the heat. So we'll start off, we're going to take this apart. I don't know if you can see some of that crud in there. That's the buildup. It's, it's, this is pretty normal, even though it's been, actually this has been all winter. That's all we have. Okay, now we're gonna, gonna scrape this out into this. It's a little harder to see. Uh, 
Now we'll set this one back. We found this is the easiest way. Just put it right in here and we'll scrape that out. I've got a scraper. This is for uh, actually for scraping the side of your house when you have a lot of chip, chipping wood. And then we'll give it the brush. Still feel a little bit up in here. Got to get it up where I can see. Yeah, that's that's pretty clean. I don't know if you can see up there. Anyway, I'll give this to you, Janice. Now we've got the inside of the chimney here, and this here, it's got about three quarters of an inch, so. It's going to mess, get, it, get a little bit of a mess out here. Kind of scrape it towards the, towards the chimney. I need to, probably need that flashlight also so I can see a little bit better. Thank you. Oh yeah. You see in there? That's the creosote buildup. Can't get it every little inch of it. Now another thing that you can't quite see, but I guess we'll we'll get the camera to take a look down from up above here. Okay, you can see down there that leads down into the bottom of the stove. And I'll just gonna have to that right here it is a good a good inch thick. And at the bottom, I have to, there's a little ledge. A little ledge here that I have to scrape it off of so that it gets down into the bottom of the stove. So that's, that's pretty clean right now. Now we'll put this back together. It's fine. Got to get the seam to the back. Okay, there we go, that's that part. Now that we've gotten the chimney clean, the next thing is to get the top of the oven. And what I'm gonna be doing is scraping underneath the, the stove top. There, as you can see, there's quite a bit of ash in there, you see it? We're gonna be scraping that and scraping it into the firebox. So just, just go back, pull it, And then we'll be pushing it over into the firebox. Okay, now I'm going to uh, use a little rocking apparatus in here on this, the lever on the back to, uh, as you can see it moving and letting the ash fall down into the ash pan in the bottom. Now I'm going to take some of this loose ash that uh, that doesn't all. I can get quite a bit of it out of there, but it doesn't take it all out. It's just to take some of the load of this. Got to kind of move slowly with this ash, and you just keep going until you get it as clean as you like it. Now we've got the ashes uh, pretty well cleaned out and left a little pile in the center. You can see the real good action of this.
Okay, now we're going to take the ash pan out. It's pretty full. This is about a half a season. And we'll put, yeah, put the lid on and that's it. Now we want to get the creosote buildup that's underneath the oven. Now that we've gotten everything from the chimney down into the back below the oven, we've gotten, we, um, we've gotten the ash out of the top of the oven. Now we're going to get the last uh, of it. I say we just finished also the dustpan, so this is the last step. These two little nuts here, I only make them finger tight so they can come off when we need them off. And to take this plate off, you have to open the door. See, there's a little bit of the creosote buildup right there. And this is the tool that you'll be using. Now we're going to tape this box right to just below that opening so that the uh, creosote can be dropped into there. Now what I have to do is I have to get this tool back inside there. I'm just going to pull a little bit out just as this is all the stuff that goes to the bottom. Looks like could have had a little bit uh, wider box. Now what I want to do is get the flashlight. Now you can see all that buildup. It'll be on all over the sides, hanging from the t under the underside of the oven, and uh, that's that. What we're about to do now, and I have to go way back to the back where the chimney drops some of this out of the chimney into or out of the pipe, stove pipe, into this back of the oven. So I'll be cleaning that out. We usually do this about twice, two to three times a season. And uh, sometimes we get a little bit more, sometimes we get a little less. So usually a little bit more than this, but uh, it's a good uh, half a box or three quarters of a box full in there. This is a little outlet to clean between the oven wall and the outer wall. That's one of the areas that uh, without this little area here or a little opening, you wouldn't be able to get in and clean that thoroughly. So that's what it's for. Now to uh, complete this, I have to close that up again. Oops, can't go too far. I've got to go halfway. Put the two little nuts back on. And that completes the cleaning of the stove and the stove pipe up to the chimney. There are some things that I would like to tell you about over here where when I'm making a fire, I like to, I like to start with fire starters. A lot of times people think of their newspaper and they'll wad their newspaper all up and put it in the stove. Well, you can do that but I like to bank my fire a little bit on the side with, um, I guess I could actually show you what I do. And I like to take, let me explain first what all of these are. These are, these are pitch sticks and we usually chop them down much finer than this because that's going to burn a long time and it makes a lot of smoke. So usually we'll cut these down to about half the size and then just make a lot of little sticks out of them and fill a little bucket with those and put those in there. They'll burn a long time while you're trying to get the rest of your wood to start. Um, you can do birch and birch, I like birch the best of anything we've used. And birch has a unique little characteristic that you can just break off however much you need. And um, sometimes you might find yourself needing some more, but it just, it just rips so easily. And you don't usually need more than a couple of pieces, and that will burn long enough to get your wood to catch. 
Then there are these little things here. They look like little little cupcakes because you put them in a in a little cupcake cup. And that's a fire starter. And what that is, you just place one of these on top of your little stack of of um, wood that you've got set up ready to go in the stove and light the paper and then that thing will take off and what it is is it's cedar chips you can buy bags of cedar chips don't throw away your burn down candles because you melt these candles by the end of the season you and collect them from your friends too um, can put all of these things into a pot melt them all down and then you get it's kind of like a little family project. You get a pot going, you have to be careful because wax doesn't boil. And uh, so, so to be really careful, just get it melted and fill a pot up with these cedar chips and then begin to pour this melted wax down in and you can stir that in until you get a nice mix of wax into there. Then you can just bring them out with an ice cream scoop and shape them, drop them into, into a cupcake paper and just kind of press the paper around it. And we've put away, oh, a whole big box of them that would last you all of your, all your needs for the winter. And um, you've got those to light to help you get a fire started. Then of course there's always pine cones. If you collect them early in the fall They'll just dry and open up. Everybody knows about pine cones. And those, those burn nicely. And, um, and then also to help keep your chimney clean after you've cleaned your stove out, you can toss in some potato peelings. Whenever you peel your potatoes, save your skins. It only takes them two or three days to dry out on a, on a cake rack or something. And when they're dry, we just put them into a, into a jar and then you just toss a handful of those into your fire. You are going to get creosote buildup, and um, it's nice. It would be nice to think you only had to clean these stoves out once a season, but we find we have to do ours two or three times in a season, and um, this just kind of helps. But as you recognize, you'll know by the smoke that's coming out into your room that things are beginning to plug up and it's time to clean things out. Um, then don't worry about putting your potato skins and those things in because you don't want a hot fire while you know that there's creosote built up in there. Okay, we have some newspaper. I still like to start my fire with a piece of paper, I guess because it lifts the wood up off of the bottom of the stove, especially when it's been all cleaned out. And I just twist it. There are fancy ways you can do it, but, and we started out thinking, oh, we're going to be real fancy with our stove, and, and we had the ones you tie in a knot and all sorts of things, and it's just going to burn, so we eliminated that plan, so I just twist it around and create sort of a knot, set that down in there, and then put a piece of wood beside it which is still small, but it has enough lift to it, better than laying one of these little sticks down there. That would be too, too low. So you get one that's just got a little bit of buildup and you begin to, to lay your, your sticks on that paper. And the paper is holding it up. That's why I like to use the paper. And the thinner the, the kindling to begin with, obviously, the more like tinder it is, and it'll catch faster. And so we want to do that. And when you have no ashes down on the bottom like this, when we clean out our stove to, to be able to go right back into using it, we don't clean the bottom off quite, quite that much so that we can take right off with our fire again. And... Uh, and then I'll put a few more of these little sticks. It's nice to live where we have some woods. And um, this one is birch. So that burns hotter, and I want to use it later. So I'll just lay some of these on. And then when this whole thing gets started, 
then I know it's going to take off because these are bone dry. Obviously, when you start with a wet, with any damp wood, it takes a long time to start and then it smokes like everything. Um, we have all kinds of, of little fire starters. We've done matches, we've done everything except the Indian rub the sticks together. That We haven't had time to do that. So, this one, um, we'll just go down in here and we'll start the paper in a couple of places and then it will kind of take off on its own. And I like to shut the door when it's doing that because it wants to smoke, so I'll shut it. I hear it popping. That's another thing about a wood cook stove is there's a very comforting sound when it's making all its little ticking noises. And you can tell when it's warming up and you can tell when it's cooling down. When it's warming up, it tends to make a faster, higher sound. And you'll grow accustomed to that. And then when it's cooling down, I can be sitting in the living room and I can tell it's time to put wood on because once it has has made all of its little noises and gotten up to heat, you don't really hear any more on the stove itself. You'll, you'll hear the flames going, but, but when it's doing that little early and late ticking, then you know that, that the stove needs some more wood. It tells you, I need some more wood. So just come over and unless you're letting your fire go out. Okay, we've got a little bit of flame and a little bit of smoke. So I'm going to just toss this piece of birch in there and then you can watch how quickly that birch wants to take off. It just starts making all of these loud noises like, like it's pitchy. And um, after that fire gets going and I know I'm going to be here cooking, I'm not putting in fire or wood that's going to last for the night or warm the house. I want to cook. When I cook, I use small pieces of wood. When I first get the fire started, I'll use maybe a piece of wood that I would burn just to warm the house. But from that point on, once I have my bed of coals, I begin using these, watching my temperature on my stove, I begin using smaller wood. Sometimes you can get the smaller wood um, you know, it's like, oh man, do I have to make wood now, two different sizes? Well, sometimes we've cut our wood too big for the stove and you end up having to cut all those little ends off. That's perfect wood for the stove, for, for cooking. When you want the fire to get going fast, then I will put some birch in, um, whatever you have in your area that is a hot wood and get that going and get your your temperature of the top of your stove up as quickly as you can we have it now at quarter after one and then we can just begin feeding this fire now that it's going just begin feeding the fire until it's actually a roaring fire and i have gotten my top up in about 20 minutes to where i can provide a good meal, get a good meal started. So we're going to go ahead and put these small pieces in since they're here and I need them out of the way. We'll just begin dropping the wood in. And maybe about one or two more of these. all the noises that this thing makes. Okay, this is, you see this little hose in here, it's a pipe and it's a U shape and that's what the water goes through and is heated to go up to the hot water heater upstairs and that water goes up by convection and then, then it will fill the hot water tank and then we can have a hot shower. And this little firebox will heat your whole house 2,000 square feet 
And we have successfully had it do that for us, even below zero temperatures. One of the things that you might want to do that I didn't think to do was I bought beautiful white mitts. And they cost plenty of money, and I decided, oh well, they have turned black from all the ash and everything that you deal with. Um, so I wanted to pull this casserole out of the oven. And if I'm not going to eat right away, I'll set it right up here because this reaches 250 plus degrees up here on this shelf. So if you end up with one of those, you purchase a stove that has a warming oven, it's so directly above this heat that you can just about bake things right in there. Um, when you're controlling the temperature for things that are baking and you want to be down to 350, which this stove, this is only measuring the door. So we've learned that about 50 degrees hotter than what it says on the door is what it is in what you want it to be inside. So I want this to say 400 degrees in order to be 350 roughly in there. Anytime a recipe gives you a heat um, amount of heat that you should be baking at, it's merely a suggestion on a wood burning cook stove. There are ways you can tell, you can stick your hand in there depending on how long your arm is in there before it blisters. Tells you whether it's going to make bread or it'll do cookies or you know whatever it is that you want to do. You can kind of get where you know what's happening just by the amount of heat that's blasting you when you open up the door. And when you start the stove, you're working with your, your bell um, damper over here or your, your air intake. And so you want to make sure that that is closed when you start baking. And you want to turn this down. Once you've got your temperature up to the 400, turn it slow. Don't turn it off, but just turn it slow. And from that point on, you're going to just watch that door and see what that temperature is saying. I'm not saying you have to be glued to the stove, but you know, periodically keep checking. And if it's even beginning to go down a little bit, it's time to add a short piece of wood in there. That's about what you want your fire to look at, look like the whole time you're baking is just a small amount and usually a couple of pieces will keep you right up at that temperature. And that, that should suffice till you're ready to go to bed and you want to put full size pieces of wood in, turn it down and go to bed. One thing I wanted to talk about was the teapot. I love a whistling teapot, but when you have a stove like this that can get up to 600 degrees, um, it tends to blow the whistle. So there's no whistle left in my teapot. So um, I still love the teapot and I didn't throw it away just because the whistle blew out of it. And uh, I, I just wanted to let you know that if you want to spend a lot of money on a pot just because it makes a pretty whistle, it may only pretty whistle for a short time. And so you have to like the pot for other reasons too. Um, I also wanted to let you know about a little bush called aloe vera. With this stove, you need a large bush of aloe vera. And so what I do when I get a burn, and I just got one yesterday, but I got it right here. You can't hardly even see that it ever happened. And I just take my thumbnail and I peel down one side and, and just sort of work it underneath there leaving it all together, but then I just expose the jelly that's on the inside and I just slap that on there. Sometimes I'll just take a piece of saran wrap and have my husband, of course I won't have this part sticking out, but I'll just tear off a piece and I'll put it on there and saran wrap that on there and go about your work. And um, before you're through, before the day is through, you should pretty much have this Slimy stuff is wonderful, and uh, you should pretty much have your burn gone, at least controlled. So it works for bee stings, mighty nice for, for I don't know about honeybees, but it does, oops, sorry, it does work for um, 
wasp stings and those kind, those kind of creatures. Um, I wanted to talk about trivets. Make sure when you buy a trivet that it doesn't have the little rubber feet. If it does, pull the rubber feet off because you'll have them on your stove. I use these trivets because if I'm, if I'm boiling something over here and I'm ready for it to just simmer, just, just keep some heat on it, then and I don't want it here where it's kind of medium heat and over here is low heat or slow heat, um, and I still want it slower than that, I'll put a trivet down, and you can put that trivet wherever you want it. And I'll tend to put it over the higher heat because you get, you get a little better constant simmer than you would over here on low with it up off of the stove. So we've picked up a couple of little trivets from antique stores. And I use every last one of them. This one is just a piece off of an old gas stove. And uh, I use it a lot. And uh, in fact, probably every one of them gets used as much as the other one. So that's a little bit of information about trivets. We have a little, a little marble one that we made. Just a little piece of marble tile. If you can't afford a trivet, get a piece of marble tile and then chip off like four little legs and use some heat accepting kind of glue and glue those little feet on there and you can use that for a trivet. I have one somewhere but I don't have it to show. So let's get back over here to our cooking. When you've got your stove on, when you've got your stove ready to go and you put your fry pan on there, whatever pan you're going to use, I'm using a fry pan for this Min for this recipe and um, I put my oil in after the pan is hot. If you put the oil in after your pan has heated up it will act like a non-stick pan. So I just did some tofu and some yellow bell pepper, some onions and we're just going to steam this together and I did a little bit of rosemary, which I was grinding with this, my, my little mortar and pestle, grinding up some rosemary and just put some of that in there and that's going to give it some good flavor. If you don't like much or you don't like any, that's up to you, but I like a lot. So we'll put that down and a little bit of, of Bragg's for those of you who use Bragg's and give it a little bit of a salty flavor. Sometimes it actually needs a little bit more and that's up to you. And I, in this pan, like to use my my non-stick turner. And we're just going to get all of this till it has turned just a little bit brown. And that will have ensured that the peppers and the onions are done and then it will be ready for you to eat. Then you can eat it with a salad or with some garlic bread. Um, some of that bread that you're going to take out of this oven and it tastes better in a wood burning cook stove than it does in any other way you can make bread. When this is finished we will eat. You can add whatever colors, whatever things you want to add to this and get it exactly like you want it. So while that is there doing its thing, you know, your stove is hot 24 hours a day, seven days a week if you feel like getting up in the middle of the night, which I don't. But some people work at night. They come in and they would like to maybe make something to eat. and. Um, your stove is hot. It's ready for you to do whatever you want to do. Make a pot of water and have some hot tea before you climb back into bed. And, um, but this stove is always hot. It's always ready for you to do something in it. I want to talk too about foil. You'll notice that there's some aluminum foil over here on our wall and our refrigerator is back here. And when we lived in Minnesota, 
we had a little tiny barrel stove that, no, it was made out of tire rims that some fella had made and put in that house and it held little nine inch pieces of wood. And so we were chucking that thing with wood all night long, but it was very, very close to the wall. And we were talking to some people, what do we do? You know, we don't own this house. We can't put in another stove. And they said, just put foil on the wall behind the stove. So we did, and we thought, this is a joke. And, um, but we went ahead and we put the foil back there because the wall was getting intensely hot. And once we did that, we slipped our fingers back behind that foil, and it was as cool as a cucumber back there. So this is why you'll see that we have, anywhere there's the stove, we have tin foil wrapping things. We did think, oh, well, maybe we can just make it look nicer and we'll get someone to fabricate something out of, um, what do you call this, a place where they do heating and air conditioning. And we thought we would have one of those done. Well, so we used a stove pipe and we wrapped it around that log there and it collected heat so badly. So we went right back to the foil and our house is safe. So that's what we do with aluminum foil. And you can use heavy duty foil if you put it on the wall correctly. It'll look nice uh, until your cat comes along and decides it wants to fight with the cat that's in the reflection and then you gotta replace your paper. This is wood stove cookery. It's been a blessing to us to have this little book to read. It got us through a whole lot of little pitfalls. Um, it's a different kind of a stove than this Amish stove. So some of the things that she talks about in here are irrelevant, but many things that she talks about have been a lifesaver for us and got us going much more quickly in what to do to get our stove where it's functioning for us and not spend so much time learning but to learn from someone else. So that's a very good book to use. Okay, we have, this is just well, about ready to go, and while it's about ready to go, our bread should be coming out of the oven. And so we will get some hot pads on here. And a second one. And we'll pull these out of the oven. And we have crossover coffee cake for one meal. And we've got a couple of loaves of bread here for this meal. We'll put those over there. And they look pretty nice. It, the stove does a nice job. And then we've got some hot dog buns and some hamburger buns, and of course I'm going to use them for veggie burger, but we enjoy the things that come out of this stove. So our stove has served us well. We've gotten our couple loaves of bread for supper, and our, our food is ready for us to eat. Make up our little salad real quickly. We have crossover coffee cake for breakfast, and we've got hamburger buns for lunch tomorrow. And we're just about ready to sit down. So you can right. either join us, but we're glad you came to our house.